Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to this webinar, a webinar where we will introduce the report that has been produced on the collection Culture for Health, on the whole collection of materials, the website, and the report. We will introduce in this report launch the findings compiled from over 300 different scientific studies on culture's contribution to health and well-being as well as policy recommendations. And we will be highlighting eight challenges for the EU and ideas to see how culture could contribute to addressing them. We will be recording the webinar and as such it will be available afterwards. In the chat, you will be able to find a link that we have shared, and we will ask you to, to answer a Mentimeter where we ask who's in the room, what kind of work is represented, what kind of background or professional identities we have here. And so if you would please click the link and answer the questions during these first 20, 25 minutes, then we will have a look at them later uh, in, in the program. But before we start, I would very much like to introduce the speakers, and I also have to introduce our critical friend. Uh, we have a very nice friend, Dr. Kultura, who's with us and is making a long, beautiful background and will be representing the, the voice of, of the individual in, in, during this, this webinar. Dr. Kultura, a warm welcome to you. And then on top of that, we will have a number of speakers that will just introduce themselves as well. But the first speaker out will be Pen MEP, Member of the European Parliament, Penny Weiss, also from Denmark. I should have said that, but I am the director of the Danish Centre for Arts and Interculture. Penille is member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, and she will be out first. After Penille, we will have Geo Heuschler, director from the Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture from the European Commission. We will have Nils Fitcher. talking a lot! I am, I am, Dr. Kultura, I am talking a lot. I'm just trying to introduce our, our, our wonderful speakers, but you will have the opportunity later, I promise you, just as we have agreed on. They have a lot to say about Kultura. They do, and also about health and how they intertwine. How is your health, my dear friend Niels? It's fine, it's fine. It's just a very, very lovely Thursday morning. I hope you are feeling well as well, good as well. Well, but I am reading a book on how to do things in a balanced and moderated way. Oh, that is so good to hear, Dr. Kultura. That is so good to hear. After Penille and, and Georg, we will have Nils Fitcher, who's the technical officer at the Behavioral and Cultural Insight Unit at the WHO, in, based in Copenhagen as well. And then we have Veronique Westbauer from the Dir Directorate General for the Health and Food Safety. So these will be the presenters. And first out will be the MEP Penille Vice. Please, Penille, the word is yours. Oh, put your hands together for Panilla! Welcome, <laughs> Panilla! Uh, thank you, Dr. Kulsura and uh, everybody else. Uh, last time I saw um, um, a, a, a species like you, Dr. Kulsura, uh, I fell in love with the, the puppet uh, uh, leader uh, uh, who was very much uh, engaged in Søren Kierkegaard. And maybe we can use a little bit of uh, the uh, very rich um, uh, philosophy of uh, Søren Kierkegaard uh, to continue uh, our very, very important, your very, very important work uh, to um, let the commission, especially the commission and also the council, the many member states in the EU to understand then when addressing uh, all the challenges we have in the union, we must never ever forget that we as a continent is a living culture. It's a free culture. It's a culture where we have always uh, been thinking, asking questions, uh, having dialogues, but also it's a continent known by its very, very rich art uh, and culture um, 
uh, examples in all directions and all the multitudes of uh, what culture is, when culture as it is the human behavior, the human interaction uh, is being also articulated as art. Art when it's really uh, is um, uh, hitting us, uh, getting into our minds, uh, touching our hearts, making us cry, making us smile, making us uh, uh, relief uh, and everything that art can do because art is when culture is allowed to flourish. I'm educated as a nurse and I started uh, my career in forensics, uh, in psychiatry. So uh, I have seen uh, throughout my career as a nurse uh, many times when uh, art has uh, made the significant difference to families and patients, but also to colleagues on a stressful day uh, in the ward uh, or on the road driving from uh, patient to patient that when we in the night was was uh, was uh, driving through the forest at, as night nurses uh, when we had time to listen to night radio and the beautiful music that sometimes come there it makes uh, a, a, a long and and heavy night with many difficult conversations and issues you have to deal with as a nurse uh, a little bit more uplifting when art comes out of the radio. So I know that all what you are burning for, all that we are trying to do together is important and can make a big, big difference. And therefore also I welcome very, very much today that the report launch of the Culture for Health is being done. Um, and I will do the utmost I can to help you to open the door uh, more to our commissioner, Stelia Kierakidis, uh, who has been announcing that the EU uh, mental health strategy in 2023 will be launched. But when she um, uh, told that, she addressed bits and pieces of what culture is, namely business and sports and education. But she didn't mention art. And by that, she didn't mention uh, culture. Uh, and uh, I think we should help each other in how, in a maybe an artful and playful way, open the doors of Stella Kiriakides to make her aware of uh, all the vitamins, all the energy that art can provide us. Now, you are going to stay here in the webinar for the whole uh, of its, its, um, its, uh, its program. I unfortunately cannot, but I would like to just uh, say to you that I have went through the recommendations and I see some very, very good uh, proposals also on how EU can do, but also what member states uh, must do uh, because uh, health is a member state competence. But if we want to have uh, the uh, EU to flourish and get more stronger, more healthy, uh, to get Europeans thrive more and develop our culture in the future. Also, of course, uh, the EU can do a lot and must do a lot more, especially in research. You said that in the, um, it said in the uh, recommendations, also we must do more to push, push for uh, increased innovation in where arts and, and culture is a part of uh, a business concept and uh, a, a development of new technologies for our society. Also, I would like to address the very concrete idea in the recommendation to have a center for European culture, health and well-being. Yes, I'm a big fan of that idea and I would very much like to, uh, to look more deeply into how that can uh, be uh, put into realities. Also, the creation uh, of a dedicated platform uh, to use the digital tools in how to uh, provide more knowledge uh, on how uh, art uh, prescripted, uh, uh, integrated, uh, wherever we can, where people are uh, dealing with the healthcare issues, especially in me uh, mental healthcare issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now back to you, Nils, my fellow Dane. Uh, it was a pleasure to be uh, to be allowed to say uh, a few words uh, now for the beginning. I hope that uh, Dr. Kultura didn't fell asleep. I didn't fall in love uh, with him, unfortunately, uh, but I hope you will all have a wonderful, wonderful and important uh, Thursday morning. And I hope some of you will contact me after so that we can see how we can co-create 
I have this idea of how we could maybe make a little artful march into the commission and knock on the door to Stelia Kiedis and make her aware that art is something uh, not as an Pandora's box, but actually as a box of jewels uh, that we need to, to use much, much more. So let our culture live as a, an example uh, uh, of that. Thank you so much. Good Thank you very much, Penile. Beautiful, beautiful speech. And I was <laughs> asleep. I was listening in a relaxed kind of way to you. <laughs> and you may have not fallen in love with me, but I am certainly in love with your ideas. <laughs> I am. We and, will be in touch very soon. And as Søren Kierkegaard, he said, so, so beautiful is that neighbor love is the most love to express, but also the most valuable kind of love to yes. express. And we so, are friends you. and neighbors. And we, we are certainly. Love <laughs> I like very much Penilla's speech, didn't you, Niels? I loved it. I loved it. I Thank loved you very much, Penilla. And I will pay. Especially I, I because she's really raising the idea that culture has not been looked at enough in exactly. the context of health. Now, perhaps I should explain to you a little bit what culture is all about. Do you think? Let's, well, let's wait with that. Let's wait with that. I oh, will let, I will you give want you me the to word. wait? Yeah, I want you to wait a bit. <laughs> Why is that, Niels? Because I think we sh I would, you would get the opportunity to comment on it afterwards. Thank you very much, Penelope. And I would take you up on the Whoa. activist part. That would be lovely to knock on that door together. You want me to wait? Yeah. Then I will wait. Thank you very much. I will Bye. Read in the wings. I will go on with, the, with the, our next speaker, introducing Gil Heisler, the director from the Directorate Se General for Education, Youth, Sports and and culture for the European Commission. Georg, please, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. On behalf of DG EAC, and thank you for giving us uh, this opportunity to speak on this launch of Culture for Health uh, project. Uh, now, this project is uh, existing and, and, and is there thanks to uh, the initiative of the European Parliament, which provided these funds. Uh, and I think we should thank uh, on behalf of uh, everybody who is participating here, because uh, we, whatever we talk about, it's always also important to have the political support and to have the money to do things. And I think uh, this is good to see that this has happened here. I mean, this only started a year ago, but it's quite impressive what we will be looking at uh, today uh, as results already. Uh, our role of EAC, uh, it's a bit following what, what the MEP uh, Bermila Weiss said before. Uh, it's not so easy to mainstream uh, culture inside the other policies. So I believe it's fair to say that uh, my director general defending the cultural, uh, um, the cultural side has been uh, lobbying inside this institution, but not only inside the Commission, also with Parliament and with the European, with the Council, Council of Ministers, to make this issue a cross-cutting issue and to make sure that this is listened to and seen by everybody. We had a very interesting seminar last week in the European Parliament. Uh, I think I should here again thank uh, Bermila Weiss because I, I believe it was on her initiative. Uh, where both uh, Maria Gabriel, the commissioner in charge of culture, and the chairman of the cult committee, uh, Mrs. Fahayen, have, uh, I think, made an important uh, launch last week, uh, a political launch, supported by a lot of uh, support from, from uh, uh, research and, and science to make this issue uh, a top priority uh, for politics. Now, uh, the thing is, what, what's happening now and what's happening next, I think it's, it's such a crucial moment uh, because we do have a lot of research, we do have a lot of knowledge, and I think we will be seeing parts of that uh, today in, in the presentation. Uh, but now, obviously, it's, it's necessary to, to start to be active and uh, to set actions. 
uh, we need to look at the resources, both the human resources and the financial resources to be able to do something. But we also obviously need to know, uh, we need to have the political support to do something. Uh, we are having, uh, you might know that in the Creative Europe uh, project, uh, a project which is called Voices for Culture, Young People. Uh, and they have uh, a project which is called Youth, Mental Health and Culture. This is going to be presented in a fortnight from today here in Brussels, and we're very much looking forward uh, what type of angle they take on this issue. Uh, you also might uh, know that uh, the Council of Cultural Ministers next week is adopting a work program for the next three years for culture. And there is really a, a game changer in this work program because we do have, uh, for the first time, a culture and health putting together not only the ministers of culture, but also the minister of health. And, and you certainly might remember that our president, uh, uh, von der Leyen, in her State of the Union speech, has made mental health a priority a political priority for 2023 and that will give a very very strong push for us for the services here to be working on this uh, i'm particularly happy to see today my colleague veronica vaspa from dg sante uh, she will present healthier together initiative which i believe is exactly what we need uh, going in the direction where we both work together not only the ones who are in the cultural part, but also the ones who are on the more real side of health and health issues. So very much looking forward to the discussions uh, this morning and, and uh, very much, I think, using this momentum we have now that everybody seems to be pulling in the same direction. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Gio, and thank you very much for, for mentioning the focus of, of next year, 2023, on mental health and not, not least in the terms in the, in, in the case of youth and, and uh, youth culture that you will be launching very soon. Thanks a lot. We will go oh, on. What are we doing on time, Niels? We are doing with, I think we are pretty much on time. Thanks to Gio being so so good in staying to this to the minutes that he had gone in the program so i think it's it's a uh, yeah it's it, it's looking good don't you think i think it's great good that we need to think about time in our relationship to health and to culture as well it's Absolutely. one of the main elements that we need to consider yes i'm talking about elements you will be coming on later with the recipe won't you how do you know that i think i just sense that that would be the thing after our last conversation. I love cooking and I will make a big soup of all of the ingredients we need when we are thinking about culture and health. I'm going to make a culture health soup. Amazing. I'm looking very, very much forward to that, Dr. Kultura. Thank you. Thank you, Gio Häusler. I will give the word now to our next speaker, who will be Nils Fietje from the WHO, the Technical Officer on Behavioural and Cultural Insights Unit. Nils, please. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my fellow Nils, from one Nils to the other Nils. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Thank you very much for the invitation. I I'm going to start us off with a short anecdote, um, and I, I hope you'll all indulge me. Um, as a person of uh, uh, from WHO, anecdotes are, are sometimes frowned on, but I think they play a very important role in, in our life stories. So a, a few years ago, my mother retired after more than, I think, 50 years of work as a school teacher. And I think the change was difficult for her, um, as it is for many retirees. She was left disoriented, unbalanced, aimless, and, and I think she lacked energy. She experienced anxiety. She, she ate less. She grew weak. And one day, she fell and she broke her hip. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I wish for someone with an arts and health background to provide emergency care or perform the necessary hip replacement. I'm very, very grateful that she had access to a modern, responsive health system and that a highly competent surgeon operated on her. But I will say that the operation was only the beginning. For, for a young person, the hip replacement is a relatively inconsequential operation. 
but for elderly patients, it's anything but. Studies have documented a, a one-year mortality rate of between 12 to 30 percent in patients of, of over 65 years of age, and, and that's because in elderly patients, a relatively simple biomedical problem turns into a complex, multifactorial challenge involving mental health, accelerated muscular atrophy, decline in well-being, loss of motivation, loss of social connectedness, loss of hope. And this is, I think, where arts and health interventions shine. Arts and health activities can help address such complex challenges because they themselves are multimodal. They operate on physical, social, and behavioral levels. They can help reconnect people socially. They can help improve certain physiological symptoms through targeted exercise. They can help facilitate healthy behaviors they can reinvigorate patients by giving them a sense of meaning and by giving them a sense of purpose. WHO produced its own scoping review on the evidence base for how arts can support health. Um, and uh, by that, and in doing so, it, it casts a spotlight on the growing momentum within the arts and health research field. From dancing for Parkinson's to singing groups for mothers with postnatal depression, our report showed how arts and health interventions can help with promotion of health, prevention of disease, and the treatment and management of a variety of illnesses. But every day the field moves on. And I'm very, very happy to see that almost exactly three years later, the Culture for Health project has taken WHO's report and expanded it in several important directions, adding more layers and dimensions to the evidence base and reinvigorating the policy discussion. Now, I, I don't want to be too simplistic. The report is thorough and detailed and merits a close read. But the conclusion I take away from the report can be summed up in a short sentence. It's time for action. Time for policymakers to act on the evidence, to integrate social prescribing mechanisms into their health systems, and to invest in culture as a driver for health and well-being. It's a multi-sectoral win-win one in which a culture sector that's been hit hard by COVID-19 can develop new avenues for employment and investment, and one in which the health sector that has also been hit hard by COVID-19 can relieve strained health services with health-promoting interventions that complement biomedical treatments. Now, I don't want to leave you hanging. My mother did make a full recovery, and many years on, she's thriving once more, even without the help of an arts and health intervention. But I feel certain that she would have benefited greatly if she had access to, for instance, a senior dance program targeted for post-surgical recovery. And I look forward to a future where such options are part of our everyday healthcare experience. Thank you very much. Oh, Niels, I was so worried about your mother. And maybe you can send me her phone number and uh, I can go and sing with her. I think she would love to have a chat with you, Dr. Kultura. I am planning to visit her right after this conference today. Thank you so much. And I'm so pleased that she is feeling okay now and doing things. Thank I you. Like so am I. So am I. Multimodal, multi sector. And I'm going to add one multi hope. Multi hope can be activated by the right ingredients between culture and health. It's a great honor, Niels, and my dear friend and brother, Niels, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kultura. I, I, I was also very moved by the, the fact that Niels' mother recovered fully, but I really like your, your, one of the, your last points, Niels, that culture is a driver for, for health and well-being, and we it's time for action. It is truly time for action, not least based on the enormous findings and outcomings of the report. Thank you very much for your contribution. Our last speaker this morning will be Veronique Wasbauer, Principal Advisor for the Di Directorate General for Health and Food Safety. Veronique, please, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Niels. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with, uh, with you today. Um, so, first thing I would like to say is that uh, we need to underline the added value of the report Culture for Health. 
uh, it uh, contributes to foster health in all policies and the specific actions in particular towards mental health. Uh, as already mentioned by Niels, uh, the topic of mental health and well-being is high on our agenda and rightly so. Uh, mental health problem, um, problems affect millions of people in the EU. Uh, the 2018 report on the state of health in the EU mentions that mental health problems affect about 84 million Europeans. That is one in every six citizens. For the same year, the total cost of mental ill health were estimated around 4% of the GDP, more than 600 billion euro across the EU. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a substantial increase in mental health issues. In the first year of the pandemic, the global prevalence of anxiety and depression increased by a massive 25%. Younger generations have been among the most affected. It has been estimated that between 10 to 20% of children and young people in the EU faced mental health problems prior to the pandemic. This number now lies at 20 to 25 percent. In addition, we all know that the war in Ukraine, current economic and societal issues negatively affect EU citizen mental health. So as mentioned by Georg, we need to take swift and ambitious action and to coordinate our action to address these arising challenges. The Commission is doing its part in this important area. Speaking about the EU health programs. First, more than 28 million euros have been allocated to mental health actions in the last three years. Second, the Healthy Year Together initiative launched in June this year to address the burden from non-communicable diseases includes mental disorders as a priority. In this initiative, do you hear me? Do you see me? Yes, we do. We hear you and oh. we see you. Okay, fine. In this Health Year Together initiative, the work on mental health will, for example, focus on promoting mental well-being, improving access to high-quality mental health services, and tackling stigma associated with mental health problems, and on addressing health inequalities. Third, we are also supporting and financing the transfer of best practices between our member states. For example, with 5.4 million euros, the Commission supports the implemented joint action, rolling out in 21 countries a suicide prevention program on a mental health system reform. Two other best practice programs will be launched end of the year to enhance social skills of vulnerable children and adolescents. We are also helping displaced people. We have mobilized over 11 million euros to provide urgent psychological and trauma support for people fleeing Ukraine with the International Federation of the Red Cross. Four other projects on best practices in migrant and refugee populations will start this autumn. In her 2022 State of the European Union address, President von der Leyen committed to work on a comprehensive initiative to address mental health. The preparatory work for this new initiative is underway. Many EU policy areas will have an important role to play. This includes a major contribution to mental health resilience provided through cultural, sports and leisure activities and policies as underlined in the Culture for Health report. I would like to underline that DG Santé has created an EU health policy platform 
to structure the dialogue with uh, patient groups and health professionals. There will be a webinar with stakeholders also looking at aspects of mental health on the 28th of November next week. And everyone is welcome to join and give their views on priority actions to be supported. So uh, as a conclusion, I uh, would like to say it is important to size the moment and to voice your views and to voice the conclusions of the report participating to uh, this uh, event to ensure that mental health initiatives embed all relevant approaches, including the one voiced in your uh, report. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Veronique. I think it's, um, it's very uplifting that all four of our speakers are underpinning the fact that we are drawing in the same direction, that we are aiming in the same direction, and that there is an increase in cross-sectorial collaboration in terms of how culture and health can work together and culture can, culture can be, as Nils put it, a driver for health and well-being. I think it was interesting to hear Penny Device touch on the opportunity to engage more clearly in a kind of activist way building between the parliament and the commission building directly to the commissioner commissioner of dge act and see what we can do to 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 improve the position of culture for health also supporting the idea of a european center for culture and health in in a wider perspective i think it was nice to hear geo underpin the idea of cross-sectorial approach on mental health and the need for a swift action a swift action now something nils also underpinned in, in his presentation but also in the, how this present report launch is basically expanding the scope of what was already presented three years ago so there is also this notion that we are in a development curve which is basically addressing an increasing problem just as we were just so told us that one of six is suffering from mental health issues in in the european union and mental health among, among young people is one of the most present and discussed issues in in mental health in denmark for instance there was a large event just last friday in the national gallery uh, in a collaboration between the danish center for mental health and and the National Gallery on how art can actually become a driver and help with mental health issues. So a lot of different activities are taking place. And I think this is a, a moment of intertwining these different threads and lines and perspectives into one kind of movement and that now we can actually do something about it. While I have been summing up, I can see that my good friend and colleague, Dr. Kultura, has been preparing a kitchen session so just like in morning television i would say let's go to the kitchen and dr kultura what are you doing i'm seizing the moment i heard somebody say seize the moment and so i'm cooking culture and health soup i need the ingredients what do i need um what should i put in a soup of culture and health news um uh, well, I put some culture in and I mixed it up and I am now going to uh, add the, uh, health aspects. So you're, put, you're putting culture but and you're putting it's not enough. Health. No, it's not enough, is it? We what about... A, we need a few more things. Yeah. Well, I, it should be spicy, shouldn't it? It should have ah, some... How about some social spice? Nah. <laughs> social That's amazing. spice. A social spice sounds just amazing, doesn't it? And uh, how about some? How about some care? Care. We need care. I mm. need care. I need hair, but I also need care, and uh, we all need care. So culture and health mean? and social spice. And was that a big or a tiny spoon of care? Oh, that was um, uh, a whole, whole terrain of care. 
It all must be prepared with the utmost care, otherwise it will not be palatable. And uh, I think it must be palatable. Oh, we need some trust. Yeah, oh, trust, that's such a lovely spice. It, it just kind of evolves all the other I tastes. I sit on the it? soup that looks like I trust it. And uh, we need attention, we need time, and we need understanding. And one more thing, Niels. Sometimes when we talk to culture professionals, they talk about one thing. And sometimes when we talk to health professionals, they talk in a little bit of a different way. Yeah, like Danes talking to Finns, for example. We need to understand each other and learn each other's languages, wouldn't you say? Yeah, we, we, we do. And we, right. Not, not right. least how to navigate cultural differences. Right. Are you sure that's healthy, Dr. Kultura? That doesn't look like I'm, anything I would do. I'm just tasting it. And it's oh. delicious. Oh. And it's giving me hope and purpose and imagination and creativity and healing. It's just delicious. I wish you could all taste it. I, I would wish for all of us to taste it, but maybe we can have the the recipe by the end of the day and send it out to all our participants. I think the whole idea of culture and health and a tiny spoon of, of hope and lots of, of trust, not least the social spice sounds like a fantastic soup. Amazing. And Thank you very, multi very much. Multi-sector working. Yeah. And talking about multi-sector working and multi-perspectives, I think it's time for us to ask in one of our our good colleagues and friends, Cornelia Kiss, who has been leading this process for, for, for Culture for Health, and ask you, Cornelia, could you would you please present the scope of the of the review for us? Could you like would you like to do that? Cornelia, you are a policy of you are one of the officers from Contracts in Europe. Hello, Cornelia. Hi, Dr. Kultura. Nice to meet you. Oh, you too. You look very, very intelligent. <laughs> I think I will try to provide everyone with the recipe. Um, I'm here to uh, give you an overview uh, of uh, the Culture for Health project. And uh, I will now also try to share my screen uh, to show you uh, the recipe that we, we have been preparing uh, within the Culture for Health uh, Consortium. Um, the Culture for uh, Health Consortium uh, uh, is actually uh, implemented by Culture Action Europe, which is a cross-sectoral cultural network and an umbrella organization representing culture, the cultural sector with over 190 members by uh, Cluj Cultural Center based in Romania, who has been working uh, on the arts and well-being topic uh, for a long time now, uh, by Drusto Asociacija based in Slovenia, a national network of NGOs uh, uh, and independent creators, by Central Denmark region, by the Northern Dimension Partnership on Culture, which gathers Northern states uh, with the Secretariat in Latvia, and Trans Europe House, which is a network of over 90 bottom-up cultural centers all around Europe and, and beyond. Um, uh, basically, culture for health, we are looking at it as a soup, which has a lot of ingredients. This delicious soup aims to trigger a true policy change to uh, bringing together the health, cultural, and social sectors. Um, and uh, we are very happy that uh, the European Parliament has uh, has initiated uh, uh, so something what is called an EU preparatory action um, in the topic of bottom up policy development for culture and well being in the EU, and therefore uh, it also has uh, a financial envelope next to it. Uh, the consortium has has um, 
uh, one uh, this possibility to implement it through an open call. Um, and uh, yeah, these are, uh, and I've just mentioned uh, in the bottom, you can see uh, all the partners who are uh, helping and driving this process together. Um, Quadra for Health basically uh, um, aims to, to prepare this delicious soup that also Dr. Kultura has been uh, giving us uh, the recipe of. Because indeed we need uh, trust, we need, uh, uh, we need to speak each other's language, we need to see what are the obstacles of, of working uh, together. Um, and one of the things that we, uh, we started doing is to, uh, to collect evidence on, uh, on uh, how culture contributes uh, to our health and well-being following, of course, also the WHO 2019 report that was mentioned earlier, but we widened it, this widened it, widened the topic um, uh, to, a, to, a, to a broader um, uh, understanding of how culture contributes to health and well-being. Um, Raritza, my, my dear colleague from Cluj Cultural Center, will be telling you more about, uh, uh, more about this, um, but uh, Basically, the bottom line is that we have collected over 310 scientific studies uh, into this Culture for Health report. And we have also organized uh, three roundtables in Denmark, Italy, and Romania um, with the strong support of, uh, of uh, the local organizations team and the Northern Di Dimension Partnership on Culture, where we, where we gathered experts, policymakers from the health sector, from the cultural center from the social sector and try to understand basically how we can uh, work on these topics together. There are countries within the European Union which are much more advanced in these topics and, and have are implementing even programs and have strategies on it. And there are some countries in the European Union which don't have um, uh, or, or, or maybe just have just poly, uh, project level initiatives. But what we have found during our mapping um, of uh, projects and programs of the uh, uh, of the European Union and and actually even be beyond that in every country there are projects existing that are on the that are collect connecting uh, arts, culture, health, and uh, and well being and the social sectors. Um, and uh, but uh, the issue is that it stays on project level, and it always uh, comes with a short term funding, which means that it's not a strategic long term policy change that is happening. And uh, that is the small <laughs> ambition that we have uh, with the Culture for Health project to change that to really, uh, uh, really uh, make a. Um, to, to trigger a policy change in, in this area. Um, so what I'd like to call your attention to that in our culture for, for health.eu website, we have collected uh, over 660 projects um, all around Europe, um, which, uh, which uh, work in this area. And the, this database is searchable by country, by by um, by art art form by uh, by target group and so on. So it is also possible to uh, to use as a resource if you want to start, for example, a new um, new arts and health project um, to to use that database. And don't you don't need to reinvent the wheel, but already connect to other initiatives in other countries. Um, also. Uh, we uh, the culture for health project is uh, testing uh, six pilot projects on the ground i will tell about them later um, uh, in in my next slides uh, and we also want to feed uh, the learnings of these these projects of course into uh, into the discussion that we are talking about um so what i wanted to 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 really uh, stress is that during the discussions with experts and policymakers and practitioners, we have gathered a series of policy recommendations, which uh, our dear uh, researcher Dr. Mafada Damosto will be um, will be presenting to you. Um, and these are a result of one year long discussions with the with our dear advisory board and 
with all the experts that we have met uh, during this process. Thank you very much, Cornelia. <clears throat> and before leaving the floor for, for Rarita and you to continue, I would just uh, add to, to all our participants today that you can raise questions and we will be able to, to highlight these questions uh, by the end of the session. Yes, we really want your questions. Thank you. Cornelia, please, back to you. Yes, thank you so much. Cornelia, uh, see you later. <laughs> See you. Well, I'm still staying a little bit. I still want to talk about a little bit about our pilot projects uh, okay. that are happening. Um, uh, I just wanted to, to let you know that in uh, um, one of the projects that we are trying to, uh, to see uh, across uh, Denmark and Romania is the Music and Motherhood project, which is about organizing singing groups, uh, reducing postpartum depression. So in uh, Everyday word is the baby blues after giving birth. Some some uh, women experience that, uh, and uh, there is a scientific testing uh, also supported by WHO um, on uh, on on the results of of uh, group singing for mothers in this uh, condition. Also, another project that we are testing in Central Denmark region is culture in hospitals, uh, how live music in intensive wards uh, can affect the patients. Um, and uh, I invite you to stay on also after one o'clock because this project will be uh, presented. And actually most of these projects that I'm telling you now will be presented also in the afternoon uh, in the breakout sessions. Um, another um, area for testing is arts and culture in nursing homes and elderly homes. Um, we are testing if dementia patients uh, living in nursing homes uh, uh, or, or, or patients uh, with disabilities living in nursing homes, how culture and arts can help uh, their conditions um, in, in a way uh, that, uh, that is beneficial for them. Um, another set of uh, uh, projects are more on the pr uh, promotion, health promotion and prevention side. We, of course, uh, especially in the case of mental health, there is not one point where you say from this point on you are ill, let's say, but of course there is a point of diagnosis. But um, definitely what uh, we are trying to say as well, that for example, an intergenerational parade in a deprived neighborhood is actually a prevention uh, of, of maybe, uh, maybe some kind of diseases or addic addictions uh, that could happen. Uh, here you can see the picture of uh, Partot Parata in Bologna. Uh, this uh, project is, uh, is implemented by Associazia Oltra, uh, which is a Trans Europe House member. Uh, where, act, uh, where children and elderly has been working for months and months, uh, making costumes um, um, for a parade. And of course, uh, there are social connections uh, uh, during these, uh, these uh, workshops. And it's not only the parade that, uh, that uh, is important, but the process, how we get to that uh, parade. Another, um, um, very interesting project uh, in, uh, implemented by Druso Associatia is testing how businesses can take up uh, uh, cultural enterprise certificates and uh, also how, uh, for example, uh, instead of going to bowling for a team building activity, why don't you do a cultural um, cultural activity with 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 the staff and uh, how, for example, instead of getting a gym. Uh, prescription. Uh, also, you could get a prescription for a dancing class and make you feel better. Uh, this, the, the final project I wanted to tell you about is cultural participation of people with mental disabilities um, uh, in cultural life, uh, where um, uh, in Slovenia, uh, Truk Sferik, uh, a Trans Europe House member, is, is trying how to involve uh, more people with mental disabilities into cultural productions. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to tell you about is what is coming up. Uh, I will also uh, 
tell you a little bit about it at the end uh, of, of the of the sessions. Uh, but uh, here are some dates that uh, that we are already we already know that will happen on the 8th of December. Um, uh, Member of European Parliament uh, Georg Gulis is organizing an event raising citizens' awareness on the importance of culture in Europe. Culture for Health will be there and it will be streamed. Um, then in April, we are planning to organize a conference in, in Slovenia. Um, on the 23rd of May, we will have a policy discussion uh, in Brussels, uh, hosted by the Lithuanian permanent representation, um, uh, where also Helska clowning will be showcased. And our final conference is planned for the 7th to the 9th of June in Alefsina, uh, European Capital of Culture 2023. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful, Cornelia. All these projects are beautiful. How do I, how do I participate in them? Just write me an email. <laughs> I will write you an email right away. I'm looking for my computer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Kultura. Thank you very much, Cornelia. I think we will jump right into the to the next presentation, which is by Radica Brantner, who is from the Cultural Institute in, in Cluj. And, and Radica, you've been leading or coordinating parts of the of the research, and I would like you to to just help us dive even deeper into the findings of the report. Guys! Radita, please, the word is yours. Uh, thank you, Niels, and uh, and thank you, Dr. Do Dr. Kultura, that you're helping uh, ease a little bit the um, um, sober air <laughs> in, in the room. Um, I will share my screen and um, start... Uh, my presentation. I hope that it's visible. It is. It is. We can see it. Yes. Okay. So, um, first of all, uh, what I would like to say is that our report um, is the um, uh, is the, it's a team effort, um, and it includes two main parts. The first of uh, first part is a scoping review, which is a mapping of the literature, scientific mainly scientific literature in the field of culture, health, and well-being. And the second part is dedicated to um, analyzing the related policies and uh, proposing specific policy recommendations. And um, I will now make uh, a presentation on the first part, but I will, um, and then Mafalda later on will will present the second. Um, what is important to say is that the objectives and the research questions um, of the scoping review have been defined by the guidelines of the preparatory action bottom-up policy development for culture and well-being in the EU. And um, uh, what, what we aimed was mainly to provide a structured argument for explaining the key relevance of culture for health and well-being, to identify the key dimensions of the topic, and to summarize the existing knowledge in the um, in the field and and what you see on the screen are the research questions and the first two are the ones that are addressed by the by the scoping review so um what is the the evidence base uh, we have been uh, screening um at the level of title and abstract uh, around 6000 um, studies of different methodologies and designs from meta-analysis to systematic reviews, scoping reviews, randomized controlled trial, uh, mixed method studies, um, qualitative studies, a wide range of, of, um, of, of research. And um, we have included in the, in the research these uh, 310 studies, which um, um, we have kind of structured and group under four major teams. And, and you can see on the screen also the numbers of, um, of um, studies that are included in each under each chapter. Um, maybe it's, it's worth to say that, uh, that some of the studies are relevant for more than one, one of the teams. Um, about our uh, scoping review, as already has been mentioned, um, it's, it takes stock and builds upon the findings of the scoping review, what is the evidence of, on the role of arts in improving health and well-being that has been published in, in 2019 by the World Health Organization. 
And um, when it comes to the topic of culture and health, it uses a similar approach and presents the evidence on the, on the contribution of arts and health under this two dimension of uh, health uh, uh, promotion and uh, disease prevention and management and treatment uh, of existing conditions on the other hand. But it uh, it also adds um, um, and, and broadens um, its thematic scope and introduces this dimension of how culture uh, influences personal, subjective well-being and, um, and community well-being. And uh, we also looked at how culture has been influencing the well-being of people during the uh, COVID-19 pan pandemic. So to, to respond to the to answer to the first uh, research question, what is the evidence um, that involvement in cultural activities improve the health and well-being of citizens? Um, as already mentioned, we have been um, extracting information from these 310 reports. And uh, what I'm sharing on the screen right now, it's somehow, um, somehow a map of the main um, health and related outcomes that we have found being mentioned by these various research reports. So um, in the... As, as you can see, and maybe what uh, what this um, table that I'm not going to present in detail is um, is uh, telling us is that this is a very broad field. It has many many facets, and um, it in, um, this is maybe also one of the reasons that um, it is quite difficult to speak of culture and well-being um, in in simple terms. Uh, also, each report has its own definition of well-being, its own uh, tools to, to, to measure them. So it is a very complex and, uh, and nuanced field. And I will, I will just uh, mention um, a few examples of the, um, of the benefits that, uh, that we identified through, through these reports uh, in terms of um, the, the link between culture and health. Um, first of all, what, what, what we can say is that um, regular participation in cultural activities like going to the theater or to um, weekly dance classes or uh, going to museums and uh, uh, visiting libraries, they tend to be generally associated with um, uh, uh, an improved quality of quality of life and health related quality of life and different aspects of, of well-being, um, which is already um, a hugely positive sign. Then uh, more specifically, when it comes to um, promotion and, and, uh, and prevention of disease, what we notice as for, is, for instance, that uh, engagement with um, cultural activities can support not only in elderly people, but, uh, but it seems uh, that, um, that this is a particular um, area of evidence, increased social engagement, decreased anxiety and depression, and even improved functioning in terms of um, uh, physiological um, functioning. Um, in terms of um, Maternal mental health, it has been already mentioned, uh, singing interventions and music listening, but mainly singing interventions um, in, in groups uh, where mothers, uh, uh, new mothers are singing together with their uh, babies are very, in, uh, um, are proven to be very effective in um, supporting maternal mental health and um, generating uh, mother-infant infant bonding. In terms of management and treatment of existing conditions, um, it is uh, it is proven that um, engagement with different types of, type of cultural activities, and I would uh, come to this a bit later on, what type of cultural activities uh, seems to to have benefits for the quality of life of patients that live with um, with chronic health conditions, to improve the physical, uh, psychological, and social um, outcomes of the elderly people living with dementia. And here, um, examples of, of uh, relevant projects are like uh, uh, museum activities with people uh, with dementia, where, for instance, engaging with objects from museum collections and telling stories around them, uh, support uh, people living with dementia to um, uh, activate memories, uh, improve 
uh, improve their mood and um, and and state and and with with that also the the relations with their carers and it is also uh, proven to be um, a way in which the the um, work of carers of people living with dementia is um, is being supported. So um, there are also um, more specific um, findings, uh, and and I will later on go through through uh, through more uh, findings. Just to say, for instance, that. Uh, uh, listening to pre-recorded music before and after sur surgery helps reducing anxiety and uh, support improved recovery. And uh, when children are going to undergoing various um, uh, medical interventions from blood screening to uh, surgical interventions, the presence of artists and um, and different uh, cultural interventions support um, relief of anxiety and uh, both in the children and their parents. When it comes to, um, let's say, personal uh, uh, personal well-being, um, our scoping review found that involvement with the arts is associated, among uh, other benefits, with higher life satisfaction, reduced anxiety and depression level, improved moves and emotional regulation, increased confidence and self-valuing, and all these are really important um, in um, in our communities nowadays. And um, more specifically, again, reading enables the development of empathy and the finding of meaning. Watching visual artworks may help with stress reduction. And for instance, sketching can facilitate people uh, to have experiences of flow, like being in the zone, which is important for creativity. And um, again, community singing can help uh, social integration of older adults and uh, promote resilience. And I think when talking about resilience, it's important to share some, some of our findings related to how culture has been experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a survey that we conducted uh, during the first month of the pandemic um, in um, several um, EU states uh, has shown that actually being confined to, to their um, homes and not being able to engage in physical outdoor physical activities, actually engaging in um, arts and creative activities has been the preferred uh, leisure uh, time um, op uh, option for, for most of the people. Uh, I think the exception was the Italians that were still preferring to cook <laughs> than to engaging um, in, in the art. And um, um, it, it also showed how um, um, Engaging with this type of activity help people to deal with um, with um, emotions and and uh, um, improve their resilience. And um, noteworthy is the fact that people stated that they have been um, through engagement in these various um, cultural and creative activities. They found innovative strategies to cope with the challenges and the un unexpected uh, circumstances of the pandemic. In terms of uh, community well-being, um, we see that uh, different levels of community well-being can be impacted um, by um, uh, engagement with with arts, from uh, uh, social inclusion uh, of different uh, vulnerable groups, from uh, people uh, at the risk of exclusion, such as people living with disability, minority groups. Um, people that have been forcibly displaced or people living in poverty in rehabilitation centers or people that are living with various health conditions. Um, we, we also see that uh, museum libraries and other cultural venues can play an important role in enabling access to culture to a range group or uh, to a range group of um, to a wide group of uh, of uh, um, people from, from, from various walks of life and also provide um, um, an access point to uh, different social services. Creative and social skills are increasingly required by the uh, current labor market. Um, so um, we, we find that there, there's evidence how culture and, and the presence of the art in workplaces can support um, reducing stress and increasing the quality of work environments and the management of burnout symptoms and increasing collaborative skills and development of resiliences um, around the work and workplaces. 
This is also ve um, valid and valuable in relation with uh, school-related well-being, cultural activities that are happening in, in schools, um, during classes or after classes. Um, they help with um, stress reduction, with development of cognitive and emotional skills, and um, may support also reduction of risk behaviors. And, and um, also, I think it is important to mention the dimension of the quality of public space design, which um, also influences also how people at individual and community level experience uh, well-being in, in cities and in, um, in rural settings. And uh, what we found is that pla uh, places that are green, active, pro-social and safe, may enhance the social participation and positive emotions. And there are not so many studies that are looking at um, indeed uh, at how things are happening, are being uh, influenced at macro level. But what we can say um, uh, is from, from the few studies that exist that for instance, a cultural a city that has a rich cultural strategy and, uh, and, uh, and a rich um, cultural infrastructure and cultural offer is able to provide um, uh, better well-being to the to the citizens um, living in that community. Now, to to address the second question, which is um, which specific forms of cultural uh, involvement appear to have a more positive impact, I would begin to say with something that Niels um, Fitche already mentioned. Um, this is um, a logic model that um, that has been developed uh, by the authors of the. Uh, WHO report, Frankfurt and Finn. It's a logic model, model linking the arts and the health, but we can extrapolate it also to the other dimensions of, of uh, the link between culture and, uh, and uh, community well-being, for instance, is, is that um, engagement with cultural activities have, has several components that usually it's not just one of those components, but more. So speaking about ingredients, there are several ingredients like sensory activation, involvement of the imagination, aesthetic engagement, social interaction, physical activity, engagement with the themes, themes of health, uh, cognitive stimulation, being in touch with emotions. And, um, and these, they they generate res they generate responses at psychological, physiological, social, and behavioral level, and by this, outcomes at level of health and well-being are being uh, mediated. And just to give an example, for instance, if we are speaking about uh, people participating in in a community theater, let's say, there's a, a lot of views of imagination, social interaction there. People work there with emotions, their, their uh, uh, brains are being stimulated. Sometimes even the topics that are being dealt with in the, in the dramaturgy of, of those um, uh, community theater events or, or, or plays are, are being relevant for, for um, raising reflectivity and um, um, addressing some, uh, some uh, aspects related to health and well-being. And these, in uh, in turn, would would have people experience uh, positive emotions or um, reduce feelings of loneliness, um, feelings of, of of belonging, and and this in in turn would have impact on their health and well being um, at, at 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 all these different levels. Um, and now. Saying that, uh, as, and again, as, as Nils has mentioned, uh, cultural activities are very complex activi um, activities, multimodal, um, and um, and as said, they they work with various mechanisms simultaneously and can produce uh, health and well-being related outcomes simultaneously. More of them at the same time, and although we cannot uh, give any recipe. Um, um, about what is being used um, to generate which type of uh, health and well-being related benefits. Uh, what we can notice from, um, from what is most often um, um, being cited in the, in the report is that, for instance, activities like music and singing, um, be, it, be it participating in workplace choirs or community choirs or uh, listening to music at home or attending um, uh, concerts um, in philharmonics. Uh, so a, a very wide range of uh, music and uh, 
music related activities, including playing instruments, can support, uh, for instance, stress and anxiety alleviation, social engagement and connection. Then drama related activities can support social interaction, positive mood and health promotion. Health promotion, especially by tackling subjects related to, to health. Um, and in this way is often uh, um, bringing uh, information to more remote communities that don't have access to a lot of um, up-to-date information on health. Then um, again, coming in different forms um, uh, from going to, to dance performances uh, to attending dance, class, dance classes from of all different times uh, from ballroom to hip hop can support social engagement and physical functioning. Clown interventions, especially in hospitalized, uh, in, in hospital environments help anxiety and stress reduction in relation to to being in, in hospital and, and going through different medical procedures. Reading and writing are found to um, support um, finding of meaning and reduction of, uh, reduction of risk behaviors. Visual arts can, in specific settings, be it seeing um, um, a drawing, for instance, or, or, or a painting, or engaging directly in, in drawing, um, sketching, um, doing various um, uh, crafts can reduce feelings of loneliness and isolation if this happens in a group setting and promote a finding of meaning. Photography and film, they seem to be quite good mediums for um, supporting stress reduction. And when proactively uh, engaging with these media, um, self-reflection and self-expression is being supported. Architecture and design are really important in, in especially when it is about uh, public spaces like schools or healthcare environments. The way in which these spaces are being designed, the light, the colors, uh, how the space is enabling social interactions are really important for people's well-being. And um, again, museum visits uh, have uh, an important potential for health promotion, well-being, and social inclusion. Um, and um, there are several factors that, uh, that we have um, uh, been discussing in the report, um, and I'm aware the time is um, running a bit behind, so I will try to, to stick to only some of these aspects. First of all, um, that we can see that um, um, the, the various uh, reports are referring to different types of engagement with art. On one hand, is um, going to like to regular cultural attendance. Yes, going to to theaters or but also cultural consumption. So this is a uh, cultural uh, being exposed to um, uh, arts and culture that is being provided by um, cultural professionals regularly. Is um, is supportive for, for health and well-being. But then there's also these specific art interventions, which are mainly uh, designed for community interventions or um, health-related interventions, where the, let's say, the design, the format, um, the types of interactions, the objectives themselves of the interventions are being designed, having in mind the desired um, outcomes, what we want to improve in relation with the specific needs and conditions of the target group. Then uh, what we also notice that more than two thirds of, of, the, of the studies included in our report are refer referring to um, active forms of participation, meaning people being engaged in the creative um, activity themselves. Um, and only part of, of, of the reports refer to receptive participation. And, and that does not, does not necessarily mean that receptive participation does not, um, do, does not have um, uh, relevance. Um, there, there are even studies on, on a large pen, uh, panel, uh, large, large population samples showing that um, um, receptive participation can, can even more support um, well-being and life satisfaction than, than active engagement. And there are, of course, also um, studies that are um, looking at both active and receptive or combining active and, and receptive participation. Like, for instance, for visiting um, um, an exhibition and then engaging in 
discussing about the exhibition and drawing and uh, uh, and interacting with others. Um, we see also that these activities can happen individually um, uh, in, in a home setting, for instance, um, or online. Uh, or in group settings, and uh, most of the most of the studies are actually referring to activities um, in group settings. Um, there are also different ways of engaging with with this type of activities. Some of them um, are um, people voluntarily uh, engaging in, with cultural consumption and participation based on their interest and and taste and others are looking at recruiting people or uh, through various social or health uh, referral um, uh, platforms and programs um and and also based on open calls and and um, and different other types of enrollment like people offering this type of uh, of possibilities to engage with art in in workplaces or in schools where people are already present. Um, it these type of activities are also happening in various environments in various places, um, even in on in online environments. Um, this is something that has been um, more researched upon uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, what we see, mainly see that when it comes to um, engagement with the arts, um, most of the interventions would have more than one, um, usually more than eight, 10 uh, sessions. Um, so um, although uh, a single interaction with art um, at times may have certain benefits, it seems that it is necessarily to have um, a critical mass of, of exposure and, and engagement to get more benefits and have a sustained effect of those benefits. It is nevertheless important of the skills and um, and um, and the framework. Um, like, for instance, if um, um, what are the skills of the artists and um, um, professionals facilitating this, facilitating this type of activities and um, different types of formats and uh, and especially the artistic content um, and the quality of the artistic processes themselves. And um, I would. And by saying that what we can say is that there is definitely a vast body of evidence that that encompasses a diversity of studies and methodologies that um, as um, as our map showed, it is a very broad field. It has very many um, facets. So it is not so easy to um, to tackle and definitely not easy to put into um, like into um, simple uh, policy proposals so solutions um, are are more more often uh, complex and um, differing from um, from the type of benefits that we want to um, achieve from health to community engagement so um, also we are seeing that there are a lot of piloting happen there's a lot of piloting happening uh, in in countries uh, around the globe and also an intention to scale up this type of activities and again when scaling up these activities is important to have in mind that um, 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 when we want to multiply them in different cultural contexts we again need to look at research and uh, and 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 uh, and pilot and test how these uh, interventions need to be uh, adapted. Um, there is need for, for further um, research, and, and I would mention here the need for fundamental research, especially, for instance, in the neuroscience, explaining how uh, cultural participation uh, is triggering uh, uh, changes in, uh, in our brain, and how digital cultural participation can produce um, um, positive outcomes. Um, it's also important to mention that not all types of um, uh, cultural participation and not all, all types of culture can, can have positive effects and there are negative effects. Not so many uh, re reports are um, actually mentioning ne negative effects, but they are possible. So this is really important that we keep in mind this complexity um, when designing activities. Um, and uh, for uh, for that, our report is providing um, a, a synthetic table of evidence with basic information about different um, uh, research reports and their uh, approaches. 
but uh, cultural professionals willing to design their own um, cultural activities should look actually at the should use this again more as a um, 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 repertoire and then and then look to the reference list and go to 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 see the details of each individual uh, report. There are, of course, already concerns that we have heard from, from uh, cultural professionals that we have met that um, this uh, um, having the agenda on the agenda more and more, the, the possibilities and the, the potential of culture to impact well-being that, that may become a standard by which cultural activities are being um, evaluated. And we very much advocate for that not being the case. There, there's also the danger of instrumentalizing culture, but we we, we think that this um, can be addressed through through the right policies. And as a final word, that uh, we can say that culture is not a panacea, but we can contribute to a more comprehensive and effective uh, response to current global challenges. And later on, my colleague Mafalda will talk about how we suggest that our findings can help us address some of the urgent global challenges. Thank you uh, very, I would, very I would much. Here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rarita. It's it's been a great, great pleasure hearing you. Um, and I just wanted to raise at least one of the questions that we have had in the chat because I think it's a, the complexity you and Cornelia just have outlined for us and unfolded is is a complexity that obviously raises a number of questions in the with our participants. And one of them comes with the question that with all the initiatives and groups that are available, which which is the best way to start engaging to with to discuss possible research in the field of clinical trials? Where should you go from that? Well, which I, is the I best think that's... to start engaging. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh... Um, I hope I get the question right. M my suggestion is that one way to start is, for instance, to read our summary um, um, document and and get uh, get an idea, get to orientate through that. And then, um, as I just mentioned, that um, looking through the uh, this summarizing uh, table and the annex of our report, people can find a very summarized description of of reports, so they can create an image of what research they would like to find out more about and then go to, to the original source and find the details. And I suggest that um, what we found very important is to have to be um, um, given the opportunity to engage in dialogue with, uh, with other researchers and, and practitioners. And for that, I suggest that, that you join the, the, the group, the Culture for Health, Facebook group that is a place where we can continuously share information about research, ask questions each other to each other, and keep somehow in touch about the different events that will give us the opportunity to also meet face to face. And then also make use of the website, I guess, because the website actually presents 300 plus examples of how to work and where to work and whom to engage with. Yes, yes Dr. Kultura, please. I'm sad. Why are you sad? Rajita didn't say anything about puppets. I'm oh, uh, sad. Because yes. we have been working in hospitals. We have been working with adults in hospitals. We have been working with people with dementia. We have been working with education and prevention. I'm I'm sad that we forgot to mention you as well. But I I want to say that we did not forget, but 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 because of the 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 brevity of time, I, that your work is included under drama. I hope that uh, that is reasonable for you. But we are definitely taking stock of the of the value of the work that you are doing. Thank you, Rajita. I thought it was a wonderful list and a very 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 detailed explanation of so many ways that we can activate our emotions and deal with our stress and our loneliness and look after our mental health and learn more but i am rather stressed right now niels yeah 
I can understand that. Maybe we should have a break. Should we yeah, take a 10 minutes? I am stressed right now because I, I need a cup of tea. Okay. On that note, then, I think we will have a 10 minute break and we will all meet back here at 11.40. 10 minutes break and then we will continue with the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Rajita. Thank you. Cornelia it was very, very, very interesting. And I'm really looking forward to getting involved in all of these projects and visiting you. <laughs> Cup of tea. I'm drinking it now. Thank you very much. I'm drinking it now. What are we doing now, Niels? Do we Actually, have uh, any results from the mental meter? Yeah, the mental meter or the mentimeter. I, I think the mentimeter is actually showing us who's in the room. Should we have a look? Yes, please. I would like to see the mental meter. What field? I'm not in a field. I'm in a house. Ah, uh, okay. But this isn't more the kind of field in which people work, you see. Ah, ah, ah. So... What does it say? It says, hmm, let me have a closer look. Can you see it? 64, so 66 in arts and culture. Hmm. And uh, 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 15 in health and 30 in a mix and 8 in other. Well, I would put myself in a mix and other because we need to make what's that thing between Denmark and Sweden? The other, you mean? Yeah, exactly. We need Something to make between. a bridge. Yeah, we need to make a bridge. We a need bridge. to build a bridge. Oh, this is a I think bridge. it's. But don't you think it's interesting? The social spice is there as well. Can you see that? Oh yes, I think it's very interesting that social spice is there. I yeah, like a bit of social spice. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, shall we look at the next, uh, next question? Yeah, there were two questions. What describes you best? What describes you best? Oh, I'm very handsome. <laughs> That's new, new meals. New. You are. No, no, no. That was you. You are much. You're so attractive. But look at that. We Policy have makers. Exactly. Twelve. Practitioners, 45, 33, researchers, others. Hmm. What is an other? I think that's good. I think other could be, what, what, what could the other be? Oh, the other could be interested parties. I love exactly. those interested parties. Oh. Exactly. The interestees. Interestees. Very, very I... good description, Niels. Hmm. Well, of course, we would like to have a few more health um, uh, policymakers in here to help us activate our proposals to get culture in prescribing on a regular and established basis. Yes. At least it's make a sure very, very that interesting gathering of people, and I really enjoyed all those talks this morning. I learned a lot. So, so did I. So did I. And I think it would be very, very nice to even get even deeper. So, I think it's time for us to invite our next speaker and co facilitator moderator on board, Mafalda Damaso. Mafalda is our policy recommendation person, our anchor point, Dr. Mafalda Damasco is our report researcher, lecturer at the Department for Arts and Cultural Studies at the Erasmus School of History, Culture and Communication at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Mafalda, you have been with us all the way, and I think know this whole session is being designed by you around the but around your, your report and, and the research findings. Please take over. Thank you very much, Niels. <clears throat> uh, uh, can you see my screen just to confirm? Yes. yes. Yes, perfect. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Coulter, as well. Uh, there we are. 
Um, yes, thank you very much again and good morning. Uh, Niels, just to highlight again, all of this is really uh, work, um, uh, teamwork. Uh, we, several versions of the report were uh, revised um, by partners and then also by the advisory board. So I really want to thank everyone for the incredible work and also uh, for making this such an interesting intellectual experience uh, or experience from an intellectual point of view as well. Um, we don't have much time, so I'll go straight to it. Um, I will continue to focus on the report, but uh, focusing on its policy recommendations, as you said, and specifically, I will be summarizing the part of the report that answers uh, these two uh, final questions. So which policies in the field of culture might contribute directly or indirectly to maximizing the health and well-being benefits of culture, and then what synergies are necessary with other policy fields. Uh, and before doing so, I do want to stress as well that this presentation is a simplified summary of the policy considerations chapter, which is included in the report and which is more than 30 pages long. So this is really a broad uh, summary. Um, before I present the policy recommendations, I want to explain again in a very brief manner how uh, they were developed. Uh, first, based on the broad pattern that were identified by the scoping review, we asked what works and what could work better. Um, and, and, and we concluded that there is a multitude of untapped overlaps between culture, health, and well being, uh, and that tapping into those overlaps can potentially unleash, as we saw, multiple forms of benefits. We also concluded that the knowledge that exists remains limited uh, and that it is rarely embedded uh, into education and training programs in a systematic manner. And so therefore, we concluded that there are many opportunities for research, education and training, and also for collaboration in the field. Again, the report details these points. Second, uh, we read a selection of recent articles, papers, um, policy discussions, et cetera, and asked what goals should guide the policies that um, we will propose. And we concluded that we wanted these policies to increase awareness of the health and well being benefits of culture, um, that they should be built on the idea of interdisciplinarity understood here as an equal exchange between the fields of health, culture, and others, that um, level ground is really important. And finally, that these policies should have as their ultimate goal to support welfare and prosperity. And I will uh, briefly talk uh, about this final point in the next slide. Um, as Rarita showed, uh, the scoping review suggests that culture can potentially support health and well-being, both in terms of management and, trend and treatment of disease, and also in terms of the prevention and the promotion of health. So altogether, uh, in other words, cultural activities can support a holistic, long-term approach to health and well-being. And this leads me to the image on the right, again, discussed in more detail in the report. Um, so in the policy ch chapter, we go a step further and also propose that there might be a circular relation between culture, health, and well being and the well being economy. And in making the statement, we are aligned with, we are joining the work of the OECD and EuroHealthNet on the economy of well being. Specifically, we propose that culture support for health and well being could, and I'm quoting here from the OECD, could support a virtuous circle in which citizens' well-being, represented there on the right, drives economic prosperity, stability, and resilience, represented on the bottom, which in turn allow to sustain well-being investments over time, there on the left, unquote. So in this case, to be even more specific, um, this can happen by sustaining investment in cultural interventions, which then supports health and well-being, and then further, again, reinforce social stability and economic prosperity, potentially, of course. And this leads us to, um, or leads me, to our policy recommendations. They are organized into four main areas, which you can see there, dedicated strategic and financial support, knowledge and awareness building, training and peer learning, 
and then localizing culture, health, and well-being R&D policy discussions, by which we mean localizing them to further gain momentum, right, in terms of, of advancing knowledge, uh, projects, and policy in this field. I won't read them all in detail. I will simply highlight the main ideas. And again, I do want to stress that the recommendations included here are simply a summary. Uh, the report includes even more uh, recommendations. Uh, so first, we propose to include culture as an integral pillar of the EU's health strategy and as a core pillar of its own upcoming mental health strategy. Uh, this means that culture should not be seen as optional or the cherry on top of the cake, but ideally, potentially, as one of the fundamental dimensions of the EU's approach to health. We also propose that investment in prevention and health promotion, which uh, shockingly is um, only in when we focus on the EU average, uh, around 2.8% of all costs. Uh, we propose that this investment should be increased. Uh, and we also propose embedding dedicated provisions in policy documents and promoting social prescribing. Then, um, in terms of knowledge and awareness building, we propose to recognize cultural activities as complementary to traditional medical responses. That is, this is a key point, Cultural activities are not being seen as a replacement, no, but rather as something that can expand the medical um, or biomedical approach. Uh, we also suggest that it is, of course, crucial to support further, further research. There are many gaps that remain, and so we need to further support that research, and yet, at the same time, rare, uh, raise awareness of the existing evidence uh, on the uh, namely cost and namely of the cost effectiveness of supporting cultural activities for health and well-being. Uh, in terms of training and peer learning, again, this is just a very short summary. We propose namely to develop curricula and to encourage joint training, again, on an equal level. We also propose to enable and financially support peer learning and the exchange of um, good uh, practice guidelines. And then finally, uh, to advance culture, health and well-being R&D discussions, we propose localizing them into a dedicated platform and we make different suggestions on how this could achieve, could be achieved, um, the short, medium, and long term. Finally, we encourage member states, regions, cities, organizations to establish their own culture, health, and well-being strategy. And then finally, um, the team and the partners also identified eight challenges faced by the EU for which new approaches are needed. And to be very clear with this part of the report, uh, what we are trying to say, or we're trying to suggest, in fact, is that the patterns that emerged from the scoping review may also potentially provide some answers to challenges that are on the mind of decision makers and policymakers on a daily basis. And of course, uh, the previous recommendations apply in all of these cases, more research is needed, for example, and yet we already have some evidence, as I will show, uh, that potentially uh, culture could contribute to supporting answers or broader answers to these challenges. And this list is not um, exhaustive, it's merely illustrative, but these uh, eight potential challenges uh, were, or eight challenges are uh, the need for an increased focus on health promotion and prevention, a growing mental health crisis, the need to support the broader health and well-being of young people, ongoing changes to labor markets, patterns of work and the economy, an aging population, the association between ill health and patterns of inequality, promoting active citizenship, and then the difficulties faced by forcibly displaced people in the EU. Uh, we are quite behind, and so due to time constraints, I was going to highlight those four um, challenges there in yellow. I will still do that. I will, I will not mention everything that I was going to uh, mention. Um, in any case, just to give you a sense of uh, why we think that culture can contribute to potentially again to these challenges as part of broader strategies to address them. Um, in terms of um, an increased focus on health promotion and prevention, research suggests that focusing on health promotion is a highly cost-effective investment. However, as I said, in the EU, public and private expenditure on preventive care accounted for only 2.8% of total health expenditure on average. And we have quite a lot of examples that suggest that culture can uh, be part of uh, this preventive approach. I will just mention the first one um, highlighted here uh, due to time constraints. For example, um, singing, uh, evidence suggests, can help to improve respiratory and cardiovascular function. But there's also 
more research, as you can see there in the second point. Um, and we propose that this challenge could be addressed by recognizing, namely, the health benefits of culture and thus increasing the spending on, on mixed me methods, approaches, um, and based on combined efforts of health, cultural, social care, and other budgets. Again, this is um, developed in more detail in the report, which I invite you to read. Uh, regarding uh, growing mental health crisis, again, I'll only mention that first point on the left. The mental health crisis is one of the main challenges facing policymakers today, as we heard before. Um, and uh, we have substantial evidence from the scoping review that, again, suggests that culture can be um, part of the uh, tools that are used to potentially, again, address this uh, crisis. Um, so, for example, we know that engagement with a variety of creative activities benefits individuals with mental health problems through reduced anxiety and depression, improved emotional regulation strategies, increased experience of positive emotions, well-being, and improved self-acceptance. That's probably all of, no of us have, have experienced as well in our lives. And so uh, this challenge could be addressed by namely, again, supporting cross-sector partnerships to widen access to these activities. And it's crucial to say that when doing so, uh, we have to also develop mechanisms to take care of the mental health and well-being of actors involved in the implementation of these activities. Regarding challenge three, around the world, um, based, uh, apologies to read there, challenge three, the need to support the broader health and well-being of young people. Um, again, shockingly, um, uh, around the world, suicide is the fifth most prevalent cause of death for adolescent boys and girls, age 10 to 15. And uh, the World Health Organization has written that behaviors established during the transition period uh, um, of being uh, young people, uh, this can contribute into adulthood. And so uh, supporting their health uh, can be seen, of course, namely as an investment in the future health and well-being of our societies. It's also an ethical thing to do, isn't it? Um, and so examples from the evidence are broad. There are many of them. But for example, there are positive associations between an adolescent's creative engagement and the promotion of healthy lifestyles such as uh, engaging in physical activity. And so tailored recommendations include uh, promoting cultural activities tailored to this specific age group, and also, again, recognizing that cultural activities are complementary to traditional medical responses. We are not suggesting that culture can um, uh, replace uh, other responses. It's really about a broader approach to health and well-being. Finally, an aging population. We know that unless healthy aging is promoted, an aging population decreases the percentage of the workforce in good health, increases the need for long-term care and health expenditure. And uh, we have, again, quite a lot of examples from the evidence suggesting that uh, health early people's active engagement with culture uh, can support um, their, their good health. For example, their engagement with, heart, with art has positive effects on their health and well-being. We also see there in the second paragraph that activities like singing and dancing positively affect the cognitive function of elderly people, which is why we suggest, again, that uh, making cultural activities available in care and community settings, supporting uh, programs of dedicated activities involving the active engagement of elderly people could, again, support uh, broad responses to these challenges. Final slide. Um, I want to stress again that these challenges highlight how broad the contribution of culture to health and well-being could potentially be. Culture can support, as we saw, the health and well-being of the young, of the elderly, of those at work, but also of those who are forcibly displaced, et cetera. Its impact is not only multidimensional and holistic, but also um, extremely broad. And by this, I mean that if it is embedded within a broader strategy, culture could potentially strengthen social stability and economic prosperity by increasing the health and well-being of a broad range of very different groups, thus contributing to building more prosperous societies from the bottom up. Thank you very much. Um, I try to uh, be as short as possible, it's still quite long, but as you will mention, there's just so much to say uh, on this topic. Uh, and so um, I'm very happy to uh, be able to move to the um, to the panel discussion. Um, we so have just, just oh. to highlight some of your points there, uh, Mafala. I think uh, we need to put our thinking hats on. And uh, well, I think 
what you are saying mainly, or one of the things you are saying that is very important that we have to start from the beginning and uh, we have to work within uh, the health sector from the very beginning because it's going to be cheaper. That's what you're saying. It's going to be cheaper if we have culture within uh, health and society and um, uh, settings right from the start. Is that right? Dr. Kultura, I think that what we're saying is that it could potentially be cheaper. We have a lot of evidence that suggests that. I do think that we need more research, as the study suggests, but it, um, it is not absurd to make that point. No, not at all. There is a lot of research that suggests that. And also, it might support um, happier um, lives, right? Full lives. So it's really about uh, supporting prosperity in a, in a broad understanding of the word, not only in economic terms, but also in terms of well-being. It Thank you so much, Dr. Kultura. about quality, quality of life. And as Absolutely. you can see, I am part of an aging population myself. And I feel so good when I'm singing or when I'm dancing. And I hope that everybody else who is also part of this aging population could join in these activities. Okay, uh, shall we move to the panel? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks for highlighting those very important points. Yes, uh, we do have uh, a panel, as uh, Dr. Kultura just mentioned. Uh, we were uh, supposed to have five speakers. Unfortunately, Laura Norpo could not join us. Um, but uh, we will start with uh, Lina Papartite, who is the project coordinator um, at Euro Health Net. And what we'll do is that I will ask just to start a first question to Lina and then to uh, our other speakers. And then we will have a conversation. Please do add questions to the Q&A. I cannot see them now, but we will have a moment just for the Q&A later on. So I will start by um, asking uh, Lina. Um, uh, and first, for, for, to thank you as well for being here and to welcome you. Um, and I want to ask you about um, your work or the work of your health net on equal access to health. So the equal access to health and also the social determinants of health. These were really important references in our report. So thank you so much for having shared that with us and highlighting that. Um, as I mentioned before, only 2.8% of investment in health is for prevention. So can you explain in some uh, sentences, some minutes, why these ideas are so important and also why you think that culture could potentially play a role in addressing them? Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Mafalda. Uh, thank you, Niels, and uh, thank you for inviting uh, me to, uh, to speak and tell our perspective. Uh, so EuroHealthNet is a partnership um, for health equity and well-being. So uh, we are a partnership for public health bodies that work to improve the health uh, for all by addressing the underlying uh, determinants of health and reducing inequalities. So I wanted to talk about the, what Dr. Kultura mentioned, the social spices to it. And why is that? So I wanted uh, to bring to your attention the um, uh, WHO report on health equity status. And what does it state? Is that only 10% of our perceived health is um, it can be determined by the quality or access to health care services. The other 90% are explained by four factors, which are the financial security, um, our housing conditions and the neighborhood where we live. It's the quality of jobs or the environment where we work and social exclusion. And these are 90% of what explains our health. And uh, in other words, uh, health sector alone cannot tackle this issue. We really have to work together. And it seems that in this event, uh, the culture is trying to prove that they can support health, but they actually can. And this body of uh, literature, the research uh, that you have produced is an amazing resource that uh, we should take with us and uh, you know and promote and um, 
uh, yes, and implement in practice. And uh, I'm very happy to also see uh, on the panel uh, Dr. Luciana Costa from the Institute of Public Health in Portugal. Uh, we're working together on, uh, on issues like uh, social prescribing that uh, she will be talking about. So where we're trying to mix the culture and health, trying to reduce uh, health inequalities, um, and by reducing health inequalities, this is uh, what we mean. Health is a very broad, um, yes, it's, it's very broad how we define it, how we understand it, and what uh, influences it. And um, how it can help in one way, participating in cultural activities, it's what uh, Rarita also mentioned, is building skills. It can help to um, bridge the digital divide the social social divide the social cohesion social inclusion building our society stronger so it's really investing in people in human capital to make our societies uh, more sustainable and um, yes so that's uh, that's in short thank you so much uh, I, we will return to some of those points, but I do uh, want to thank you as well for mentioning social prescribing because um, um, our next speaker, uh, Julie Ward, who um, is a former member of the European Parliament and uh, vice president of the Cold Committee, um, also MEP for the UN Committee on the Rights of Disabled People, MEP of Mental Health Ambassador, uh, has also uh, been co-director of an award-winning social enterprise called Jack Drum Arts, who were pioneers of arts on prescription in the UK. Um, so, um, um, and you are also currently leading an arts and education well-being creative inquiry program. Um, in, in, incredibly inspiring. So thank you so much for being here and for joining us. Um, I do uh, want to ask you um, how, in, in your experience, culture-based social prescribing works, um, and uh, what would be the main things that must be taken into account for these programs to succeed? Uh, thank you so much again for being here. Uh, okay, um, sorry, I'm joining you from a car, and I only knew that I was doing this presentation, um, I think the day before yesterday or even yesterday. So um, I am going to talk about um, the experience of my arts organization. I hope that your questions will be answered within the talk that I'm gonna give. So social prescribing is a health service term for the linking of people with non-medical sources of support from within the community. Um, for example, targeted access to creative and informal learning activities for the improvement of mental health and the development of emotional resilience. Now, this is, um, the fact that it's a health service term, I think in some ways is a bit problematic because um, we always did it as a cultural arts organization who completely understood that arts is a factor in people, access to arts can be a factor in people's well-being. Um, I want to take just say a little bit about the local context. So my organization was one of the pioneers. We began a program in 2011. So 11 years ago, we were doing this work. And the context is um, a very deprived um, area in the Northeast of England with huge health inequalities. Um, and 2011 coincided with the era of austerity and public service cuts when um, lots of things that people used to do or used to expect as part of public services were being destroyed. So the youth service was being cut, the careers service, women's refuges were being cut, library services were being cut. And um, people were quite concerned um, about their jobs, about their, um, uh, about their ability just to get by day to day. It's a bit kind of, we're, in a way we're facing that again with the cost of living crisis. Um, but um, uh, it, one of the things that happened locally here in the northeast of England was a, a three-year program that we called Colour Your Life, Arts on Prescription, um, uh, typically six-week blocks of activity 
activities ranging from arts and crafts, creative writing, music. And sometimes they were extended beyond the six weeks for another, um, another six weeks and they were free. And it was very, very successful activity. And as a result of that, and it was commissioned in fact by the uh, public health department of the local county. But following that successful three year delivery, there was then a consortium of partners that came together um, and led by, in fact, a, a wonderful health organization called the Pioneering Care Partnership um, that was set up to kind of be a hub to look after people's health and social needs. Um, and our organization, Jack Drum Art, worked together with the Pioneering Care Partnership um, to develop the program that we'd already done that first year. And the uh, and this new program, which ran from 2014, included um, arts, education, volunteering and time banking and um, targeted uh, activities, for example, for young people who no longer had a youth service, who were socially isolated. Um, we have also been facing a kind of mental health pandemic, particularly for young people um, in this area. And um, an example of an activity for the young people was called a Cree, a youth Cree, and this is spelled C-R-E-E. -E. And here in the Northeast of England, a Cree is a kind of shed where people go um, to look after their pigeons and their birds. And this has been something that's been part of the traditional heritage and culture of this part of the world. So using that kind of metaphor, um, uh, I think help people to understand that um, this was something kind of normal. It wasn't something that was, um, uh, it wasn't something where they'd be stigmatized, okay? And I think there is an issue about talking about these things with them in a medical model. Um, anyway, these outreach programs were delivered right across the county at various community hubs um, and the activities, uh, I've kind of explained some of the activities, but they also included ecotherapy, bibliotherapy, so understanding about books and stories and poems and literary activities. Um, and um, this service was open to referrals from GPs, mental health services, health and care professionals, third sector and community organizations, statutory agencies, and also importantly, self-referrals. Um, and Jack Drum Arts invested in the training of artists to do this work, to deliver the work. Uh, and that training included things like mental health, first aid and suicide prevention and what has happened as a result of all this kind of initial work around social prescribing is that the NHS have now taken it up and it's become a key component of universal personalized care which aims to give people choice and control over the way their care is planned and delivered so this is designed to be based on what matters to the person and um, targeted and tailored to their individual strengths and needs. Um, Julie, I'm and very sorry. I'll have to ask you to just finish and then so that we move on and then we have time for the panel. Okay. So this work is now, now delivered by link workers. Okay. So there are now professionals in place called link workers who make the referrals. There's a social prescribing academy. There is also a social prescribing day. And there are now kind of programs called green social prescribing and blue social prescribing. And they recognize um, the importance of nature and the importance of contact with water, for example, and wetlands. Okay. Absolutely inspiring. Thank you yeah. very, very much. And the point that you, you started with on, um, you, in your view, uh, it being potentially problematic that the term comes from the medical model, I do want us to come back to it so that we see how we can position or we can best position these programs. Um, but I do want to move to um, our next speaker who will also um, talk about a, a different experience now from Portugal. Um, about cultural social uh, uh, based social prescribing 
culture-based social prescribing. And her name is Dr. Luciana Maria Gonçalves de Costa. Well uh, uh, welcome. And she's a researcher at the, I will translate this. I'm also Portuguese, so I'll translate it into English. I hope this uh, makes sense. It's a department for health promotion and then non-communicable um, and the prevention of non-communicable disease. So the Departamento de Promoção de Saúde e Prevenção de Doenças Não Transmissíveis at the National Institute of Health, uh, Dr. Ricard Jorge. Um, so yes, thank you very much for being here. C could you please tell us also uh, about the, um, the experience in Lisbon with the social prescribing um, projects? Uh, how, what do they consist of? What are some of the, the conclusions that emerged? Basically, our goal here is to try to understand that there are probably different models, but maybe they have something, some elements in common. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me to, uh, so you can hear me well? Yep, perfect. Perfectly. That's good. So first of all, I want to thank for this opportunity to share with you the experience of social prescribing in Portugal as a model to promote health, well-being, equity, social cohesion, and most importantly, the close collaboration between the culture and health sectors. Uh, I will try to be really brief, so <laughs> synthesize this, but uh, social prescribing in Portugal is a project that began in 2018 in two health uh, family units in, in Lisbon in a partnership with the social and cultural network using resources that uh, were already in place in the community. So um, how this work, what happens is the family doctor identifies the needs of the health center users. It refers him to a link worker that is a social uh, from the social sector. And is this person that uh, is responsible to co-design with the patient uh, a plan of activities that connect him to the community and especially and often to uh, resources uh, from the art and culture um, uh, domain. Um, and I, I will, there's a lot of partners uh, that are doing this. I will, I choose one example, one of the, the network that is the National Museum of Natural History and Science from the University of Lisbon. And this museum has in place the ongoing project that is museums and well-being, cultural prescribing. And uh, the main objective is to prepare Portuguese museum, museums and botanical gardens for cultural prescribing to include university students, seniors, and neighboring uh, neighbor communities. So uh, it's foreseen also to have a broader involvement from the academic uh, and to foster research. And also they are designing a training course to be offered to the museums and botanic gardens to uh, have a capacity building program to integrate uh, not only the, the cultural part, but also to expand this to uh, the other uh, partnerships. So um, from this experience so far, it has emerged, of course, certain conclusions and a lot of challenge. So the main uh, challenge that I would like to, to highlight, it's the difficulty to really develop uh, effective collaboration between sectors in a co-design partnership which share responsibilities with uh, roles, duties, well-defined governance. Uh, that should be a model to integrate this multidisciplinarity approach and focus, of course, in health promotion at multi-levels. For this really to happen, I think um, we, we found a great need to develop a common language, like a, a, a glossary, a definition of concepts that could be shared, not only by culture and health, but also by social education sectors that needs to be involved in this, uh, in, in this framework. Also, the, co the existence of co-finance programs by the different ministries could be uh, helping this close collaboration. Uh, for museums, for example, now that we are talking more in this culture uh, context, the challenge to embrace this culture prescribing is to integrate in the staff, uh, staff people that can develop these interventions and that uh, can be um, 
now this, this is done by the service of education in the museums, but we feel really the need for specific training, specific capacity of building and spe specialization that is necessary and urgent for that everybody would speak the same language, would know the needs and that, that really effectively can collaborate together. And, and of course, this will take a window of opportunity for the development of the role of the museums and their professionals in the area that uh, for now it's still uh, largely unexplored. Uh, finally, and from the point of view of health, since I am a representative in the sense of the health sectors, the major challenge is to promote a, a real reorientation of the health system to integrated health promotion and uh, disease prevention model, more holistic, more ambition approach to health and well-being that complements the biomedical uh, model and shift the focus to a positive health and the economy of well-being. For this, we need to have tools and tools like um, that will be uh, novel, they will be uh, foster the perceived participatory uh, inclusion of uh, all the stakeholders and that, for example, like health impact assessment could be a tool that could really help to, um, to uh, guide and to make recommendations how all these plans interventions could be done. Um, so at last, I want to, uh, to say, as a representative of the uh, of the National uh, Institute of Health, that I'm here very deeply committed, motivated to work with you and to pave the way to this healthy relationship between culture. And so that is my just one thing to mention that I think it's very important. It's briefly, the briefly. Yeah. health literacy uh, in the general population. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We found out that some of the people that were referred, uh, only 50% of them would engage. And why? Because they didn't recognize that culture and uh, these activities would be good for their health. So this is cru crucial also to tackle and it will be also a challenge. Thank so, you very much, thank you so much for Thank everything. you. Thank you very much. I will come back to some of those points, particularly um, I would like the panelists, other, your fellow panelists, Julie and others, to talk about what you mentioned regarding this, uh, what you call the positive reorientation of the health system. I think it's a very crucial point and that perhaps uh, when that happens, everything else, uh, uh, the, the other recommendations that we make become easier, right, or more likely to be unleashed. Um, I do want, though, before we start or we have that common conversation, to also welcome our final panelist, Enric Kvist. I hope that I've pronounced that correctly. Yes, welcome. Fine, <laughs> it's acceptable. And he's a member of the Regional Council of the Central Denmark region. Um, and I do uh, want to say that uh, the uh, Central Denmark region will be um, present uh, virtually in the final, in the, in following se uh, sessions. Um, uh, particularly, there will be two examples, Museum in Intensive Wards and Museums for Dementia that um, have been um, taking place there, which will be mentioned. But I would like to, of course, welcome you again. Thank you for, for being here, but also to ask you uh, if you, if you, uh, to tell us a bit more about the absolutely inspiring work that your region has been doing in this regard. Uh, so since when has culture uh, been included in the work of the Central Lui region? Uh, also, are there other examples that maybe you'd want to mention? And then finally, um, what do you think as a, a politician that is achieved with these collaborations between culture, health, well-being that would not be achieved otherwise? Um, it, it might be obvious for you. It might be obvious in the in the in the region, but perhaps it's not obvious for other people who are uh, here listening. So thank you very much uh, again, and I give you the floor now. Thank you. And uh, it's my name is Henrik Quist in Danish. Uh, always you use the H up here. Uh, uh, but I will start another place. Uh, another. Uh, I just was drawn into this uh, field a fortnight ago. I was elected from either 14 to 17. I heard about uh, culture, by, uh, culture for Health, 
But then um, I was not in the politics for four years, unwilling, but so it is sometimes. And now I'm back and I was drawn into this for only a fortnight ago. And two days ago, I read the summary of the report and it made me very happy because in my professional life, I've been working 30 years as a social pedagogue, a social worker. And the last 20 years with mental disabled people, people with different kinds of brain damage, some from birth, some by uh, illnesses, diseases, and also people with Down syndrome. And some of them had very high difficulties with expressing themselves. And uh, some, a few of them were even deaf and could not speak. But we started off with, uh, with drama, with painting, with drawing, with music, and even with old Danish folk dances. And that made some of these people, they got a language that they didn't have. They could express their feelings through the drawings, through the paintings, through the, the drama. And um, before that, some of them expressed their feelings in a very bad way. So that was a, a good experience. What we thought about, we, were, we believed in it, we trusted it, but it was very difficult to get it funded because we couldn't, we didn't have any evidence. With this report, we now have the evidence that culture in health is functioning, it's working. And uh, that makes me very happy. Central Denmark region has been working with this since uh, 2015. <clears throat> and we have you also already mentioned two of our uh, projects, but we also have choirs for long uh, patients that have lung diseases, not just cancer, but lung diseases in general. We have literary groups or reading groups for people with uh, anxiety or stress and depression, and it helps. And we have, as will you, you will hear about later, music in the, uh, the, our uh, intensive care units. And we also have uh, music in those rooms where people with kidney disease have ongoing uh, dialysis. Uh, we started off 2015 on a very small manner. And we have been increasing quantity and especially quality in, in the field for all these years. We have now better players. We are have made, making better efforts. We have better partnerships uh, than we started. We have even now get to some new ideas uh, in participating with municipalities, with uh, societies, uh, with regions, but also we are funding by uh, private funds. I think, and we think that we believe that this uh, culture by health can co contribute to the society with uh, helping people uh, achieving coping strategies in their own life. Helping the young, we have the same problem as somebody else has said uh, in these presentations. The young people after the uh, pandemia are very many is suffering from mental uh, health problems. And they have also loneliness problems and uh, social problems. And this can, can culture can also um, make them have more competences to act in their own life, to uh, get the ability to do something about the situation, make them just, yeah, happier in life sometimes and get focused on something that are good for them instead of just function of all the problems. Thank you very but much. We, 
Oh, I, I will have to ask you just to just finish and then um, uh, because we've uh, now I'll just point out one thing that we have in the pipeline. Ah. Together with the uh, if I actually first from yesterday, we have a council meeting yesterday and decided how to go that we make a interact system, we make a culture, we call it, we don't, it, in the Scandinavian languages, we don't have a common word for health, Norwegian is different, Swedish is different, so we use the word, Scandinavian word, cure, so it's culture for cure, and it's something we have to do in the next three years with uh, two or three Norwegian, two or three Swedish and two, two Danish regions that we're working together to get new ideas into culture for cure, culture for health, it's just the word, it's the same thing. And what we are putting it, uh, the, the, what do you call it? The, the aim in this uh, upcoming uh, projects are actually very, very close to the summary of the re your report here. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I think that uh, what the report um, uh, does is really add to conversations which have been ongoing, right, yeah. in, um, in, in different levels. Um, and, and thank you for everything that you said. This idea of language is a point that um, echoes what other participants also mentioned. And I do want to try to now establish a conversation. Uh, and I, I do want to start, though, before we go into more specific issues regarding how to support, how to um, expand, how to scale up, if one wants to use that term, uh, these, this approach. I do want to uh, revisit a point that was made uh, in different ways by, I think, all speakers. And so I want to ask Lena um, about this extended view of the health sector that was mentioned by Luciana. Uh, do you agree with this? Not, perhaps to an extent. How, do, you, do you think that it is needed? It is not. How, what are your views as representative of Hero Health Net in this regard? Yes, um, just to say that the Institute of Public Health in Portugal is the member of your health net, so we are working together uh, the same direction. So to, um, to say, of course, that uh, we are advocating for the broader view of health, so working with, like together with uh, different sectors to addressing, as I mentioned, the determinants of health. And um, we are at the stage of truly, as, as you said, learning the language of other sectors, uh, building the agendas uh, together or trying to integrate, incorporate. Uh, uh, our aim would also be to have a single budget for certain activities, but that is difficult because, of course, we are a, a European network and uh, those activities normally happen at national level. So uh, what matters as well is the, um, now disseminating the, the work that you have done. So truly showing the, the benefits that uh, you have compiled in the report. So the evidence that Hendrik, Hendrik mentioned, the, the evidence is there. So now we have to let everyone know that it exists and this would help us um, uh, work together to, to broaden this understanding of health and uh, improve this moving towards the health promotion, disease prevention. So sustaining the health of people and improving the health of people. Because of course, we, we may not be able to totally prevent diseases by cultural in interventions. We can delay them, but there are clear benefits of, uh, of our activities and uh, our engagement in working together. Thank you very much. So, uh, Lena, you were talking about that recognition of the benefits of working together from the health side. And now I would like to go to Julie. Uh, you uh, mentioned how uh, you said, I think, that you that you find the term uh, prescription or uh, problematic, and yet you were also a pioneer, right, in developing this collaboration. So, uh, from the point of view of someone who, uh, you know, again, you're co you were 
co-director of this uh, social enterprise, pioneer of art on prescription. What are the benefits, um, not benefits, but what is, how did you navigate basically those challenges? Um, why did you uh, position your work as arts on prescription despite those, um, those, those problems? It's probably because there were some po more positives in, in using it than, um, than negatives. Could you talk a bit about that? Well, we didn't call it Arts on Prescription. Ah. We gave the programme a name. We called it Colour Your Life. So we wanted to talk about the programme in a completely different way, not using medical terms. And that seemed to be really, really effective and successful. So I note that, I mean, I haven't been involved in the field more recently, but I note now it is becoming, you know, much more kind of mainstreamed within the National Health Service. So maybe some of the kind of stigmatization has been taken away. But initially, I do believe that if we had used the words on prescription and if we had, um, you know, I mean, just that that word, I think, would have put some people off. I did notice in the question, somebody talking, somebody asking a question, Elizabeth Nolan asked a question about how do you know, how do we get people involved in the arts who might be a bit scared of the arts, but many people are scared of doctors. So actually, you put those two things together, you've got some pretty scary things going on, you know, um, the whole medical field, if you've had a bad experience, um, like with a dentist or a doctor or something, like you really do everything you can to avoid going back. And, you know, if you've, if you've been involved in an arts activity where you were told you couldn't sing, for example, something that happened to me as an 11 year old child, actually you do become a little bit afraid of joining some of these activities. So coming up with that phrase, colour your life was for us one of the kind of, I think that was the most kind of inspiring, innovative things that we did at the beginning of the program. Um, I think there's probably much less stigmatism around the program now. Uh, it's definitely more mainstreamed. And everybody who's been through the program, who's had a positive experience, and that's probably 99% of people, because these experiences are very... Um, they're about connections. They're about people making connections with other people in a safe space, doing an activity, not under pressure, activities that um, make them, um, you know, that give them um, maybe some insight or make them feel proud or, you know, just um, the kind of therapy of just working with materials, with your hands, not having to speak, but all, I think, the people who've come through those programs have now become the ambassadors for the programs. And so there's a broad group of people within communities and within both the health and the arts sector who, um, you know, who can speak about this. So there are links for three promotional films. And one of them is a film about that very first program. And I would urge people to look at it because it's mostly people who are in the program talking about what the program does for them and you can really see they are not people who would normally be we would normally think of people accessing arts programs or going to museums or going to the opera or going to the theater but they're talking about these programs how they have how it's a lifeline for them how it has lifted them so i think that's kind of one of the ways that we need to go forwards on this is just to keep making this a more mainstreamed yeah, thank you very much. I what you just said is echoed in one uh, question, so the question that we've received in the Q and A. So I will I'll pick it up and uh, pass it on to the panel. Perhaps Luciana would like to respond, but anyone else uh, would be um, welcome to. And the question is, what does the panel think about psychological barriers to participation in the arts? Um, and um, yes, that's it, in ordinary times, let alone as a new experience for people who are the prescribed culture. Luciana or anyone else, but maybe yes. yes. Uh, well, I, as I said, I think health literacy could be something that could really uh, break the ice on, on this respect. Because people when go to health center, and if we are going uh, to put this in the question of health prescribing, uh, and the word I feel that uh, 
can be controversial if we use it in the culture context. So maybe here the, the glossary or, or the uh, explanation of terms could be uh, interesting to, to foster in order to, to have a common language that will be accepted by everybody and that could be used and everybody knows what they mean without the psychological barriers to, to be in place. And when, when a person goes to the health center with a problem, with a health problem, and the doctor says or refers him to uh, a social link, uh, link worker and says, you go to theater or you make dance or whatever, these people are not expecting this kind of, of things. So they want to be sensitized. They need to know how much this can contribute to their health. They need, so I think we, we need to go a bit back and really have um, a culture of um, of erasing the health literacy of, of people so they could themselves to be engaged in these uh, activities um, in a more um, optimistic way and knowing this will be the key for uh, raising their, their health. So uh, I think I was, since of the time, I think <laughs> I will not say more. Absolutely, thank you very much. Enring, I saw that you were nodding. Do you want to come back to that and then uh, we will close the conversation? Just a, a, a little comment. I totally agree with what uh, Luciana said, that we have also a very high non-equality in, 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 in health. And those people who have chronic diseases, a lot of them, and have very, and quite unhealthy life it's those who are not used to use a culture uh, very much. And a lot of the culture also costs quite much money. So they have to have funds for being uh, drawn into uh, use culture. Absolutely, I agree. And to connect to what Julie said as well, um, and what Lena said, this is really about providing access to um, or supporting health and well-being for all, but also it's absolutely crucial that the activities that are provided are relevant for um, those who um, they are for. So there is ob obviously an important element of bottom-up participation, if not even co-design, right? Something for um, that is very important to take in, into consideration so that these um, activities really are um, owned by and, um, and that um, those who participate co- uh, produce them and that uh, these benefits are unleashed as much as possible. Thank you all so much. I feel like we could spend the whole day talking, but unfortunately we are already behind. Thank you all very much. Um, and uh, I think that we will now uh, move. Um, Absolutely. The, yes, we'll continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Niels. Yes. It that seems good. that we have a lot of telling people to do about the benefits of cultural activities, because not everyone knows about it, so. No, but also quite important information to the cultural operators about the obstacles of participating in culture, yes. not least for people in vulnerable situations. Yes. But do you know what? I need to stretch my legs and I need to get something to eat. So let's go for a time for oh, a lunch news, time. News. Yes, there is the link. Are we, we coming to... back on the same link? after lunch no we are not coming back on the oh, same link it's a different link it's a different link and you can find the link in the chat that you received this morning or in the chat right now oh i'm hungry Niels. yes let's get something to eat and see you all see you on the other minutes. link later yeah.